Okay, so now we are recording. Sorry about that. I didn't see the option when I started. It normally pops up like it tells me to start recording. Okay. Um, so yeah, where were we? Uh, SSH. Uh, SSH is basically the, the foundation to connecting. So if you're going to connect to the clusters, uh, you're probably going to use SSH. And so using SSH with this syntax gives you a, a terminal on whatever host you're connecting to. Okay, so good data practice. The rule of thumb, one is none and two is one. So you're always going to want to keep multiple copies of important data. Um, having one, just one copy is not enough. Uh, and back up, back up, back up your data. Um, speaking from experience, um, a, a while back, a and used to not have, uh, I guess, I don't know if a and didn't have it or I didn't use it. I wasn't using um, Team Drive for everything. So I had my homework on a flash drive um, from my laptop. And uh, yeah, when, when you need your homework the most, uh, your flash drive can go missing. And then all of a sudden you're, you're, you're out of luck and um, you're at the mercy of your professor. <laughs> so um, in that, that's kind of a low stakes example, but uh, I highly recommend having more than one copy of your data. Um, if possible, having more than one copy in, in um, different locations is always good. Um, so having it saved to your local computer plus uh, a cloud resource like Team Drive um, that Google offers or I think AM is pivoting to uh, Microsoft's OneDrive um, in, in the next few years. So uh, having, it, having it stored in the cloud plus your local computer, that, that's a really good idea. Always have more than one copy of your important data. All right, let's talk about data on our clusters, Grace. So there's limits on the data on our clusters. Uh, we call these limits quotas. Um, the limits uh, are on the disk space and the file usage. So you can view your current quota with the command show quota. So you SSH into the cluster and then you type in show quota uh, as the command and this is what you're gonna get. You're gonna get an output that looks like this. Um, it gives you some columns and the tops of those columns tell you the uh, directory or the, the file system and then it's uh, the quota that's applied to it and then how much of that quota you're actually using. Um, uh, this is an example from, from Grace. Um, so you see the two file systems, you have your home and your scratch. Uh, you can see that I'm using uh, 416 megabytes. I actually, I actually think this is my Terra drive now that I'm looking at it, uh, but it's the same thing for Terra and Grace. It's going to show you your usage um, and then the limit. Um, if you need more space than what is uh, given at the, uh, at the default, um, you could submit a quota increase request. Um, I have a slide on that in, in a second. Um, a uh, quota increase request is basically, um, it, it's just a request from, from uh, you guys, from a user that says, hey, I'm doing research that requires uh, more space than the default. Um, my research is X, Y, Z. Uh, we need more space because um, of uh, ABC, and then uh, we can grant that quota uh, request increase for you. Um, you. There's two ways you could do it. You could do it through the, through the portal, or you could do it from contacting help at hprc.tama.edu. Um, but through the portal is kind of our preferred way. Um, however, we, we, we wouldn't sh uh, shoo you off to the portal if you emailed us. So if you want to email us at help at hprc.tama.edu, uh, we, can, we can take it from there. And that goes for everything too. If you guys have any questions about um, uh, high performance research computing resources, uh, anything just from like about the resources them themselves or if you need help using them, um, contact help at hprc.tama.edu. That'll get you to the help desk. It'll connect you with us, uh, myself and a few other uh, students who've been working with the clusters that we can um, troubleshoot your problems and trying to find you a solution. So back to data, uh, back to the limits, the, the default limits, um, again, there's two. So you have your, your space, so how, how much actual space the files take up, and then uh, the number of them. Um, so on your home directories, uh, you're going to have a limit of 10 gigs or 10,000 files, whichever you hit first. And of your scratch directories, you're going to have a limit of one terabyte or 250,000 files, whichever you hit first. Um, these are the limits that I'm talking about. So um, we don't ever increase your home directory. So your home directory is always going to be 10 gigs or 10,000 files. And that's because we back up your uh, home directories nightly. Um, because we back them up nightly, we have to restrict everybody's home directories to 10 gigs. Otherwise, uh, with the thousands of users, that uh, increasing their, their home quotas, that, that backup can get absurdly large, uh, absurdly quickly. So we always limit, uh, we, we will always limit the scratch to 10 gigs, 10,000 files. Um, for as long as I've been here, we've never made an exception to that, and I don't see us ever making an exception. So um, if you need to store stuff, uh, you're going to want to put it inside your scratch. Your scratch is where we have a little bit more uh, leniency. We can expand your scratch to either increase the space that you are, are allotted, 
or uh, most commonly, um, we can give you give access, like increase your, your file count. Um, so the default is again, one terabyte, 250,000 files. Um, if you hit any of these limits, you're gonna get an error that says disk quota exceeded and it's gonna basically kill whatever process uh, is trying to make those files. Um, a, a big uh, a big generator of files are when you're making um, custom environments. So you're making a, 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 an environment, let's say like in Python, like a virtual environment, and you're installing a bunch of packages. Um, those Python packages, they create a ton of small files. So it's not very big in terms of size, um, but it is creating a large amount of small files. So you'll probably hit this 250,000 file limit um, pretty quickly. In cases like that, that falls under, you know, the, the quota request um, increase, quota increase request. You can send us an email um, or go through the portal and say, hey, I'm trying to do, you know, X, Y, Z research and I'm hitting this, this quota. Um, can you help me out? And uh, we'll typically, uh, you know, work with you to find a number that, that fits your needs. Um, and then we'll, we'll grant that increase your quota. Uh, a note on those quota increase though, um, those only last for six months. So if you're granted an increase in your quota, um, let's say like from one terabyte to two terabytes or three terabytes, um, six months from the from the day that we uh, expand your quota, uh, we're gonna revisit it um, in the form of like, you know, follow up emails to you um, and, and uh, you know, say, hey, did you finish your, your research? Are you done with that space? In an, in an attempt to reclaim it. Um, because what we saw in the past was we were granting quota increase uh, to our users. And um, after they were done doing the research, they, they held on to that quota increase and we started running out of space. Uh, so, uh, you know, we want Grace to be around for a while. We want Grace to be accessible to as many people as possible. So that means having to share the space that we do have. Um, so we'll grant you that temporary increase for, um, for six months so you can get your work done and then we'll revisit it um, and, uh, you know, try to reclaim it so we can, we can help other users too. Okay, so what's the difference between the file systems home and scratch? So your home is backed up uh, and will not be expanded. That's basically the, uh, <laughs> the gist of it. Um, your scratch is the high performance storage and it can be expanded and it's not backed up. So takeaways from here, um, your, uh, the data that you're operating on, the data that you're using in your research should uh, be stored in your scratch. Uh, and, and I'm gonna show, show you guys how to, how to uh, upload directly to your scratch so it doesn't have to go to your home first. Um, you're gonna wanna put it in your scratch um, and it can be expanded. So again, if you have a large amount of data, send us an email. Um, we could we could work with you to give you um, a, a temporary quota increase um, and it's not backed up. So that's bolded because um, the only place that's backed up is your home. Uh, it's unfortunate, but sometimes we've had people call in and say, hey, I was working with data um, in my scratch and I accidentally deleted it. Um, is there a way you can help me get it back? And the short answer is no, not, not, um, we're not doing that to be mean, but it's, it's immensely costly to um, recover deleted files, um, you know, on, on a, on a kind of on a whim. Um, so, so uh, be really careful about what you delete um, from your scratch uh, and even your home too, because uh, retrieving backups, which we can do, uh, at least for your home, um, it, is, it is immensely costly and we tend not to do it unless uh, there's been some kind of outage on our end that, that caused uh, that issue. Um, so just be very careful about what you're deleting. Um, and then at the very end, uh, again, need more space, uh, send them, submit a quota increase request. Okay, data transfer, great. Get up to um, the cluster. So um, Grace's login nodes have a 10 gigabit ethernet connection to the Tamu network. Um, what does that mean? Uh, that means that they have a very fast uh, connection. So if you um, are on campus and you're uploading your files, uh, you could get them up to grace pretty quickly as long as you're on campus. If you're off campus, obviously you're gonna be limited to the, the speed of whatever um, Wi-Fi network you are using, um, be it your home internet or I don't know, your, your Starbucks internet if you're doing data transfers at Starbucks for some reason. Um, but Grace's login nodes, uh, with Grace being our flagship, it has a, a very solid um, gigabit uh, Ethernet connection. Um, SCP, SFTP, and RSync are all available. Um, these, if these don't sound familiar to, to you, these are um, command line utilities for transferring data. So you can say um, SCP, you can use SCP to move stuff from your local computer. You can use SFTP to kind of log in a, in, a, in a file transfer protocol session and um, and transfer uh, files like that. And you can use rsync too. Um, rsync is uh, italicized here um, because it's preferred. Um, the reason it's preferred is, is because it supports intermittent transfer. 
So you might say, well, why do we need intermittent transfer? I just want to transfer all my data at the, uh, in one go. And that's because um, the login nodes have a 60 minute process, 60 minute process limit. So if I start a transfer, let's say I have um, data, uh, let's say I have a large data set uh, um, and I want to transfer this data up to Grace. If I log into the login node and then start an rsync um, command, an rsync session with this command, so rsync uh, the source file from my local MacBook, um, and then the destination would be dylan at grace.tamada.edu colon slash home slash dylan. So I'm sending the file from my MacBook to Grace. Let's say I have a slow internet connection. If that transfer is gonna take longer than 60 minutes, that process is gonna get killed on the login nodes. Um, that's because we, you know, the login nodes are typically for uh, like job, uh, like real, real small job manipulation and job operation. We don't want people running uh, long processes on the login nodes because that, that's not really what they're for. That's for the compute nodes. Um, we have a way around that, which I will show you, I believe, in the next slide. Um, and then we also have GUI transfer programs, or well, GUI transfer programs are the easiest for new users. So those GUI transfers, uh, GUI stands for Graphical User Interface. Um, it, in other words, is like, um, you know, Microsoft Word is a, is a graphical uh, word processor. Um, so it, it has like a, a graphical interface that you can interact with and kind of click the buttons. That's, that's by far the easiest way um, to, to handle these transfers. WinSCP is an example of that. MOBA Xterm has the functionality, bu functionality built into it, like I mentioned earlier. And then the H4C web portal, uh, which is, again, the, the web portal is going to be the number one easiest way because you can access it from... Uh, um, almost any browser, as I like to say. So takeaways from here, uh, Grace's login nodes have a fast connection. Um, if you're going to use the command line, I recommend using rsync because rsync is um, a, a supports intermittent transfer. So if you're if you're running rsync and the file uh, transfer dies in the middle, um, rsync is smart enough to be able to resume that transfer later on. So you don't have to start from the beginning. Um, login nodes have a 60 minute process uh, limit. So if the transfer is going to take longer than 60 minutes, aka you have a, a large data transfer that you need to use. Uh, you're gonna have to use an alternate method. Um, and uh, yeah, GUI transfer programs are, are very easy. Okay, so you have uh, a large transfer that needs to be done. Um, instead of using the, instead of uh, logging into the login node, um, you would actually log into a data transfer node. So Grace has two uh, dedicated data transfer nodes, um, or two nodes dedicated to data transfer. We call these data transfer nodes on Grace. If you're familiar with Terra, Terra has the same things. We're going to talk about them too. We called them FTNs on Terra for fast transfer. Um, on Grace, we've kind of changed the name to DTN, data transfer node. So you, these nodes are accessible via Grace's login node. So you can't SSH directly to them. You have to first SSH to Grace. So you'd say SSH Dylan at grace.tamada.edu. So I log into Grace first. And then once I'm at Grace, I'm logged into Grace, I can say SSH Dylan at grace-dtn1.tamada.edu. Um, actually, you could probably leave off the dot time at edu and, and uh, the DNS would, would figure out what Grace, what this first part means. But uh, the host name is grace dtn one dot time at edu. Um, running, running either of these commands would log you into either uh, node one or node two. So these nodes, um, I, I think right now they actually, um, they don't have the 40 gigabit uh, uplink or, or yeah, connection to the uh, network as is right now, we're still installing that, um, but in the future, they will have a 40 gigabit um, connection. But the big thing here is that you're not gonna see that 60 minute uh, process limit. So if you have a big data transfer that you need to use, um, you could start that data transfer on a data transfer node um, and then uh, have that, that transfer run uh, without that 60 minute um, limit. Uh, the, the thing here is that these nodes don't have programming environments, so they're not gonna have compilers or access to the libraries and stuff. We do that purposely because um, they're not for running or compiling um, any code. They're, they're just for transferring files. So they have the um, FTP uh, utilities installed. They have rsync, SCP, et cetera. Um, but, but they're not going to have the compilers because you shouldn't be doing your work here. This is where uh, you want to connect to when you're um, making your transfers. So again, uh, the, the data transfer nodes are for large transfers. Um, you could use them for small transfers if you really, really want to, too. I guess there's no harm in that. Um, and they're accessible from the login node. So first log into Grace, and then once you're logged into Grace, from Grace, you're gonna SSH to your NetID at grace-dtn1 or two um, dot time and I'll, that'll take you to the, to the node. You'll have to enter your password and stuff again. It's gonna make you log in, um, but yeah. Okay, so 
that's basically it for grace. Now, Terra is exactly the same. Um, so all the stuff that we talked about is exactly the same for, uh, for Terra as well. Um, there's limits on how much uh, files, uh, how much space your directories can um, take up and how many files. Those limits are gonna be the exact same. Uh, and you can see those limits with show quota. So again, show quota shows you your, your current quotas. Um, and those current quotas are uh, home, 10 gigs, 10,000 files, scratch, one terabyte, or 250,000 files. If you need an increase, you could uh, submit a quota increase request um, to us, and we can um, work through that with you. Um, OK, so uh, again, same, same deal here. Um, your home is going to be backed up nightly on Terra. Your scratch is not going to be backed up. So be careful about what you delete. Um, you're gonna to wanna to move your files to, uh, if you can, if it's possible, upload them directly to Scratch. It's okay if you don't, you could upload them just to your home and then move them to your Scratch, uh, but that's kind of not super efficient. Um, so I really recommend um, putting them straight into your Scratch. Okay, so data transfer on Terra. Um, same deal with uh, Grace, Terra, uh, uh, the, the difference being um, Terra only has one login node. Um, so, so this page uh, talks about the same thing. Terra's login nodes have the connection to the Tamu network. Um, so you're going to see the fastest connection if you're on campus and connect to the Wi-Fi. Uh, well, I guess the fastest connection is going to be on campus plugged into the LAN. Uh, if you're plugged into the Ethernet on campus, you're going to have the fastest connection. And then second to that would be uh, on campus Wi-Fi. And then uh, third would be um, off campus VPN. And that's going to be limited by your uh, ISP, whatever internet provider you're using at the moment. Uh, the Terra login nodes as well, they also have the 60 minute uh, process uh, limit. So just be wary of that. If it's going to be a large transfer, you're going to want to use Terra's fast transfer nodes. Um, Rsync is again uh, preferred for its intermittent uh, transfer capabilities. Um, and all of the GUI programs that work on Grace also work on Terra. Okay, so big difference between Grace and Terra is going to be the data transfer node. Um, like I said, on Terra, it's called the FTN. Um, and it's, it's accessible slightly differently. So uh, Terra only has one node dedicated to data transfer. Again, the fast transfer node. Um, there's no process time limit here. So it's gonna have the same uh, connectivity to the uh, network as the login nodes. Um, and instead of logging into Terra and then logging into the data, the, the fast transfer node, you can just instead connect to Terra's FTN directly. So the command to do that again is SSH. Remember we're using SSH for all of our um, terminal connections, all of our shell connections. Um, and once uh, the target for this SSH command is going to be your NetID at terra-ftn, so the host name is terra-ftn, but instead of just saying .tamu.edu, we have to add .hprc. So again, Terra's FTN is accessible at terra-ftn.hprc.tamu.edu. Um, same deal as the uh, transfer node on um, Grace. It's not going to have that uh, process time limit, and it's also not going to have um, a programming environment. So um, you're not going to have your compilers, you're not going to have your uh, libraries there to, to actually run your code. This is uh, strictly for um, strictly for, for um, getting your data up to, to Terra. But it also, I mean, the nodes have access to all of Terra's file system, so you could upload stuff to your Scratch directly from these nodes. Okay, so let's talk about some command line tools. I'm going to take a sip of water for one second. Okay, sorry about that. So these are the tools that we're going to be talking about. Um, the first is CP, um, which is copy, RM for removing, SCP for secure copying, aka remote copy, um, SFTP for secure file transfer, and TAR for archiving or um, uh, putting all your files together. So the first command line tool, CP. So uh, CP stands for copy. It's the simp It's one of the simplest commands, um, and it just does exactly that. It makes a copy of a file. So the syntax for CP is going to be you call CP and then the source file and then the new file name. So uh, it's an easy solution for copying a file onto the same machine. Um, but how about moving data between machines? We're going to talk about that in a second. You can use CP if you have a file in your home directory that you want to move to your scratch directory. Um, you can copy that file in your home to your scratch and then make sure it's in your scratch and then delete the source file in your home. Uh, CP is going to be the uh, same machine. That, that's where uh, CP shines the most. Okay, so moving data between machines now. Let's say I have some files on my local computer, my MacBook that I'm on right now. 
I don't want to get that up to um, to Grace, uh, and I don't want to use a graphical user interface because I'm because uh, I just I want to use the command line. Um, oh, actually, we'll talk about that in a second. So if you want to, so we talked about copying. Let's talk about removing a file. So you copied a file from your home to your scratch. And now you want to remove the file that's in your home. You don't need it. It's redundant. Um, you say rm. Rm means remove. Pretty simple to remember. To, uh, to use it, you just say rm some file. And that completely delete the file. Emphasis on the completely. Um, it can be difficult to recover these files once they are deleted like this. So just be very careful about what you delete. Th this is the example where I say, um, like when we have people come to us and say, hey, we accidentally deleted these files, can you help us? Um, it, it's really difficult for us to say no, because like I said, the, the overhead is, is kind of, it's pretty big. There's no trash bin on the command line. Um, so if you're gonna use RM, I recommend using the minus I flag. The minus I flag is gonna prompt you prior uh, to file deletion. So whereas this first command says RM some file, this is just going to remove that file without question. Uh, Linux is going to say, okay, that file is gone. This, this command beneath it says, uh, remove uh, promptly for deletion some file. So uh, after you hit enter, uh, remove is going to tell you that it's about to delete some file and it's going to ask your permission to do so. Um, it's really good when you use the minus uh, R flag. So you can, uh, you can remove multiple files recursively. So you could point RM at a directory and say, I want you to delete everything inside this directory, recursive deletion. You'd say minus R. Um, when you do that, you're definitely gonna wanna add the minus I flag. That way um, RM will tell you, it will ask your permission um, at each step um, before deleting each individual file. That can be very costly uh, if you're deleting like hundreds of files at a time. Just be wary of that. Um, if you wanna delete a ton of files instantly, you can omit the I flag, just, just know that uh, it's gonna be pretty permanent. So just um, be careful about where you point RM at. Okay, so copies uh, files between hosts on the network. I told you we'd, we'd get from a local to remote. Um, this is secure copy, AKA SCP. So we went over copy, just regular copy, CP. And now we're talking about SCP, secure copy, which again, copies files between hosts on a network. So that network could be um, your local network at your house or a large network like the internet. That's a, that's a big network, right? So um, it uses SSH for data uh, transfer, hence um, it's secure. So um, the syntax for this command is gonna be the exact same as CP. However, um, you can see that this, um, this second uh, argument here um, is a bit longer. So I'll, I'll explain that. So first we start by calling SCP. So this command says, okay, Secure copy, source file. So source file exists in the directory where I'm running SCP from. So it's basically, this file is right in front of me. And then I put a space and I say the destination. So for the destination, I need to give it my net ID. Uh, so we're saying uh, Dylan at grace.tamu.edu. So we're saying uh, we want to copy source file to grace.tamu.edu. And then I want to log in as Dylan and then I want to go, I want to specifically place that file somewhere. Where do I want to put it? I want to put it in slash home slash uh, net ID, which in my case would be uh, Dylan. So um, Dylan at grace.tamu.edu colon slash home slash Dylan is going to put this source file on grace.tamu.edu at this path right here. So basically you just append the path um, to, the, to the file and that's where it's going to drop it. Um, it uh, can be used to copy from local to remote, from remote to local, or between two remote systems. So it'd be totally okay if I, if I put uh, uh, Dylan at terra.tamu.edu over here for the source. Um, that'd be totally fine too. I could actually, from my local computer, uh, from my MacBook, I could copy a file from Terra and just move it directly to Grace. Um, that, that's a good solution as well. Um, the thing is, you're going to have to log in a whole lot because first you have to log into Terra to get the file. Um, and then you're gonna have to log into Grace. So when you run these commands, uh, it uses basically SSH and it will uh, it will prompt your terminal as if you um, logged in and it'll say, hey, uh, you know, you're connecting to Grace, I need the password for Dylan. Um, so it authenticates uh, still with your password. So you can't go copying um, people's files without having you know their logins and stuff. So uh, yeah, it's gonna be secure like that. Okay, and then SFTP, Secure File Transfer Program. SFTP is an interactive file transfer program, uh, uses SSH again, so it's secure. Um, so with SSH, or sorry, with SFTP, um, you use it very similar to SSH. 
So instead of starting an SSH session, with SFTP, you start an SFTP session. The SFTP session is a session specifically for file transfer. Um, so when you connect, it, you're going to get a terminal that looks kind of similar to an SSH session, but the commands are going to be a little bit different. So you can say CD to change directory. That's going to be the same. You can say LS to list what's in your current directory, but then you can also say git. And if you say git, uh, you're gonna, it's going to download that file to whatever directory you ran the SFTP command from. And you can also say put. So you can use put to upload files from the directory that you, that you connected from up to the, um, the directory that you're in um, on the host that you've connected to. And then, because um, SFTP is kind of an older program, um, instead of saying quit to, to quit, um, it's, a very, it's a very proper and polite program. So you actually tell it goodbye. So you say bye and that quits it instead of saying um, quit, like rude programs like Python. I thought that's interesting. That's kind of an older programming thing. Uh, but yeah, SFTP is available. Um, would you ever use SFTP? Probably not, not from the command line. Um, graphical user interfaces that we're going to go over, like uh, the SFTP sessions on Mobile Xterm and WinSCP, they use SFTP as the back end. Um, so they're, they're doing the SFTP connection for you and then kind of presenting uh, you with a graphical option to, to use these commands. Uh, in, in addition to more, in addition to like remove and, and delete stuff, which you can also do directly from SFTP. But um, these are basically the, the underlying functions that are there. And then, um, you know, people, smarter people than I have created uh, accessible graphical user interfaces to, uh, well, to interface with uh, these commands and make life a lot easier for, for us people who want to be quick and efficient. Okay, and probably the most complicated one that we're going to talk about is uh, tar. So tar is for archiving files. It's for consolidating files, basically. Um, you use tar when you want to save many files together into a single file. Um, in the Linux world, we call those uh, um, compilation of files, uh, those collections of files, we call them archives. Um, so how do you use tar? Uh, tar's, again, got some funny syntax. Um, so this first line right here, this first line right here is how you use tar to create um, a tar archive. Um, so you first call tar, you're going to call the command, and then you got to give it some flags. We're giving it CVF. So the, the V in this case is saying verbose. So I want you to, I want tar to tell me um, about the steps that it's taking. So that just gives us some extra output to the command line so we know what it's doing. And then the CF creates an archive from some source files. So um, that is basically saying, okay, Tar, here is a collection of files. Now I want you to put them into an archive. So um, after the options, normally we say source destination. With Tar, we actually give it the name first. We give it the destination first. Or we're saying, Tar, I want you to create an archive and I want you to name it archive.tar um, and then you point it at the source. So typically you, you, the source would be a, a directory. You point it at a directory, and tar is going to take all the contents of that directory, including directory, including subdirectories and the files inside of it, and uh, create it as a um, put it as a uh, as a. I'm, I'm blanking on the word here, uh, but it it groups them all together. It consolidates all the files um, into, into one file that you could easily transfer. So instead of having to to uh, send a bunch of individual files, you could just give someone a, a tar file, and then they could run tar on that tar file to extract it, and then they get uh, the contents of the file. So uh, putting all the files together is not exactly super useful other than uh, in the way I just described. The, the big useful thing with tar is that you can compress files. So the second case uh, use case right here that we have, tar C Z V F, that's going to create um, a tar ball that's compressed. So um, the Z in this command, uh, in the second command, uses the gzip algorithm to compress your files. So you take a big uh, collection of files, let's say you have a directory full of data uh, and you want to send all that data to somebody, you can say tar czvf um, archive.tar.gz and then point it at the source. And it's going to compress all, it's going to consolidate and compress all those files into, into one tarball um, that you can just easily send around. It's going to be less, uh, it's going to be a smaller file. So it's easier to transfer and it's a single file. So you only have to give them one. And then um, to extract, um, the person, the receiving person just runs this command, tar xvf. Um, again, the V is there to give us some verbose output. And then uh, we're saying x in this case, because you want to extract, extract the files from uh, archive.tar. And this will give us, um, uh, this will give us the contents of, of the, 
whatever was put inside this tar ball. So as far as conventions go, um, whenever you tar stuff together, you typically, um, whenever you consolidate files, you want to use the uh, an extension which matches the method that you use to consolidate them. So in this case, we're, we're using tar to um, consolidate them. So I'm adding dot tar to the end of this archive. So I know uh, whoever receives this file knows that this is an archive that was consolidated using tar. Same, same thing with this second example right here. We're saying archive.tar.gz. Because we're using uh, the minus Z flag and that's using the gun zip algorithm to uh, compress this, we're saying, hey, this is an archive that was consolidated with tar and compressed using GZ. That way, uh, whenever the recipient receives this file, they know that they should extract the file using um, XZ via. So again, you use the Z command to, or the Z option inside the extract command. Um, I actually think tar is smart enough nowadays to, uh, if, it, if you use XVF on a, uh, on a dot tar dot GZ, it's probably gonna extract with the gun zip algorithm anyway. Um, but it, it's just, um, it, it's nice to know. Um, it's nice to add that, that Z option in there. Um, and then, yeah, so that, that's, the, that's the naming convention here. So if you ever see a dot tar dot GZ um, or a dot tar dot some other kind of uh, uh, extension, that's referring to the, uh, the method that was used to consolidate and the method that was used to compress. Um, and yeah, then it's useful, it's useful for consolidating and compressing files prior to transfer. So you take your big directory, you compress it, you consolidate it, um, and then you can transfer that smaller directory more easily. Okay, let's talk about GUI clients. So there are many GUI solutions for file transfer. Um, on the screen, you see a couple. We have MOBA Xterm, we have uh, WinSDP, we have FileZilla, and we have CyberDuck, and then Globus Connect. Um, FileZilla, I will say, used to be my favorite, um, but uh, the developers for FileZilla really, really dislike uh, MFA, multi-factor authentication. So when we implemented Duo at a and <laughs> FileZilla basically just broke. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to uh, find a solution for that, but um, the actual developers for FileZilla were basically like, yeah, we don't really have any plans for implementing uh, an easier method for um, two-factor authentication w w in, our, in our software. So it was like, okay, well, I guess we'll, we'll find another solution now. So FileZilla is a SFTP solution, uh, but it doesn't really work with our clusters anymore. We just include it because it's in a lot of our documentation. Um, you can certainly still try, uh, but um, you're gonna get asked to authenticate with Duo like a whole bunch of times. Uh, Moba Xterm, like I said, has SFTP functionality built into it. Um, Cyberduck is a great uh, alternative to FileZilla. I believe file, the Cyberduck is available on Mac, Linux, and uh, Windows. Um, I used it on my Mac for a while um, when I was doing a lot of transfers, uh, but now I, I kind of just use our HPRC portal. Globus is a, is a solution that we pay for at a and or at HPRC. Um, and uh, we have Globus endpoints on uh, Terra and Grace. Actually, the, Terra, the, the endpoints are actually um, the fast transfer nodes. So the Grace DTNs are endpoints and the Terra fast transfer node FTN is an endpoint as well. So that basically means that there's a there's like a licensed hosted uh, endpoint there, so you can set up a local endpoint on your computer, and you have direct uh, SFTP access to to the uh, to your directories on, on those clusters. Um, and then WinSCP is of course the, the free um, SCP client for Windows, uh, which you can easily easily download. Okay, so the uh, GUI clients, the first one, and the one that's probably going to be the easiest, and the one it's the one that I use whenever I need to um, do something like this. It's just the portal. Um, so you access our portal at portal.hprc.tama.edu. You can access your files through almost any web browser. I don't think you can do it from your Samsung TV or your fridge. I haven't tried it yet. I don't recommend it. But from basically any other browser, um, from your phone, from your uh, laptop, you could uh, connect to the portal. Um, and uh, yeah, you can access your files from there. So um, this example right here specifically shows Grace. The area you're going to be looking at is going to be files on this top maroon banner. Um, so as soon as you, you go to this link right here, log in with your NetID and password, you're given the choice of Terra or Grace, you log in. On the very top, you're going to see this maroon banner. Um, you're going to look at files, and then you can choose either your home directory or your scratch directory. Uh, and once you click on that, uh, it'll take you to a page that looks similar to the image we have on the right here. And it has, uh, this is my, um, uh, this is actually showing my home directory here, but I'm inside my scratch. So my scratch, I can see all my files, and then I can download files, I can delete them. I can edit them, copy them, view them, all that stuff. So the upload button is right here in the top, uh, top right. The download is right here in the middle. Um, and you can even open a terminal in your browser directly in uh, whatever directory you're in. So that's why I say the portal is, is really, uh, really nice. Um, probably the easiest way to do it and the most accessible way. And that's available on Terra and Grace. 
So GUI clients, mobile extern. Mobile extern is again available on Windows machines. Um, mobile extern has the SFTP side panel. Uh, again, Duo kind of broke this with some some people's um, mobile extern. It, it's broken, some it works. Uh, but basically this side panel right here gives you, it shows you um, all the files that are in your current work directory. You can click this little button here that says follow terminal folder. So wherever you go in your terminal, uh, this directory on the side will follow it. Uh, so this shows um, someone's um, home directories and you can see all these hidden files that are there. Um, you could also go to session right here. And then instead of starting an SSH session, you can start an SFTP session. And that will start a graphical SFTP session where you could just drag and drop files from your local computer like File Explorer up into Grace or Terra. Um, yeah, so that, that's pretty easy. Um, also this SFTP panel here, uh, side panel, uh, lets you download, upload files with a few clicks uh, from the command line interface. So MOBA Xterm, again, uh, pretty, pretty solid um, free application, lots of use there. Uh, next on the solid applications with a lot of use uh, is WinSCP. This is uh, just your very simple SFTP um, client. Um, here's a little screenshot of how it works. This is available on Windows machines, hence the Win in WinSCP. Um, you connect directly to a host uh, with SFTP and it allows for file transfers to the GUI. So most of these applications, this is how they look when you start them. Uh, it asks for a host name. Again, the host name is gonna be the computer that you wanna log into. In our examples, that's gonna be um, terra.tamo.edu or grace.tamo.edu. Um, and then the port number is gonna be 22. Uh, you select, you put your username in and then your password and you hit login. And it's gonna open, um, a, it's gonna open a window with two panes on it. The left pane is typically your, your local server. So it's gonna be the files that are in your local computer. And then the right side of the pane of the window is gonna be the uh, files that are on your remote host. So you could, it's as easy as dragging and dropping um, files from your local to your remote. Filezilla, this is what it looks like. This is what I was talking about with the two panes. Um, WinSCP kind of looks like this too. Um, same thing with Cyberduck. Um, this is what Fazilla looks like, although, you know, rest in peace, Fazilla uh, doesn't really play well with uh, multi-factor. So um, this is a, just an example to show you kind of what an SFTP uh, application looks like. So on the left here, you see, um, this is my um, local directory on my uh, MacBook. And then on the right, uh, it's my um, remote directory on, uh, where was I logged? I was logged into Ada before Ada was decommissioned. Um, so I could just trans drag and drop stuff over. Um, but yeah, again, host name is gonna be the cluster.tamo.edu, username, password, and then port is always 22. It should probably, it, it, most applications will automatically fill that port in for you, but if it's not uh, filled in, then it is port 22. Cyberduck, Cyberduck looks like this. So, um, uh, I logged into, I can't tell which one I logged into. I'm going to guess this one is, uh, this looks like Terra. No, this is Ada, LSF. Um, oh, it's right there too. Um, so yeah, so I've logged into Dylan at ada.tama.edu. And then from here, I can um, I can use the, the functionality to like press this button right here to upload uh, upload files. Or like since these are my files on uh, in general home Dylan, I could just right click them and, and download um, any files I need. So real, real easy. Um, real easy uh, operations there. If I click this button right here, I could also move around so I could move directly to my scratch and then upload files or download files directly from my scratch. And then Globus. So Globus is web-based with an application that you can download. The application is gonna be the, I believe that's the, uh, the, ho the um, it's the endpoint application. So if you download Globus Connect, which is the application, um, you can launch your Globus uh, endpoint server on your local computer. There's a little bit of configuration that goes into that. Uh, but Globus does a good job of having a little wizard that takes you through that. So basically the endpoint are, are the destinations for your data. So you could start an endpoint on your local computer and then that will be accessible to the endpoints on either Grace or Terra. And then you just point Globus at those endpoints and then all of a sudden you have access to, again, two pane access uh, with the left side being um, whatever uh, endpoint. Uh, the endpoints are, are called collections, by the way. Um, so uh, you can go to globus.org, log in and uh, find, uh, when you go to search for collections, you could uh, click collection search and then type in, uh, if, if you type in TAMU, T-A-M-U, you should see uh, our endpoints come up. But if you want their specific names, it's right here, TAMU Grace-DTN1, Grace-DTN2, or TAMU Terra FTN. Um, again, the, the data transfer nodes are gonna be the endpoints and then you get access to all of their, uh, you get access to their connectivity um, and all the files that are there. And then you could use these buttons in the middle to 
to create files, delete files, sync files. So you could set it up so that uh, your directory on Terra syncs automatically based on the directory that you have in your uh, uh, your your local computer. Globus is very very powerful in that regard, and it's it's uh, the go to solution for moving data between clusters. So if you have stuff on Terra that you want to get to Grace, or maybe vice versa, stuff that's on Grace that you want to move to Terra, instead of downloading it from Grace to your computer, then back up to Terra in a V shape. Just go the direct route and go to globus.org, um, add these two collections. So on the left-hand side, we have Ada. The right-hand side, we have Terra. So in, if we're sticking with my example of Grace to Terra, one collection would be Grace's DTN, and the other collection would be Terra's FTN. And then you just drag and drop, just send them right over. Um, that's going to be the easiest way. So Globus is perfect for uh, file directory synchronization and um, for moving stuff between clusters. Um, don't even bother downloading it. That's just going to take a long time. And, waste your bandwidth. And then a quick little shout out to um, uh, Temu IT. They have this really sweet uh, data classification tool. Um, it uh, It's basically um, a quick application that you can go through um, and it will help you process uh, the sorting and categorization of data based on the sensitivity of information and the impact of potential loss. So if you're working with research data that um, might be privileged or that you think um, is uh, you know, worth securing uh, and hint hint all data is worth securing um, you could go um, google this the data classification tool um, I, I believe it's actually hosted by uh, the data people at the Temu library um, but this is just the IT page on it um, if you go there um, you could run through this quick little wizard and it'll ask you some questions about your data and it'll return any uh, any um, applicable compliance um, laws or, or, or things that you should be um, keep, keep in mind while you work with this data because the last thing we want is a data breach that uh, turns around and um, harms, you know, har harms the, the user's data or the, the research participants data um, or, or a and in any way. But I think that's all I've got. So if anybody has any questions about data on Grace or Terra, um, I am happy to stay here and answer them. Um, but other than that, I really appreciate you guys showing up to this primer. Um, I believe today is the last of our primers actually. The next courses that are coming up are short courses. So they're gonna be two and a half hours in length. Um, I appreciate everybody that's been showing up to these and shown us uh you know participation and stuff it, it means a lot to us um but yeah thank you guys for coming and i hope you guys have a great rest of your friday and a great weekend i'll be around for questions Okay, uh, we got two questions. Um, the first one, will there be a session on version control? Um, I don't, we don't have one planned, um, but I, that's like the third question we've got, uh, the third request we've kind of gotten for a version control um, session. Um, it's definitely something we could look, look into. Um, Gabriela, I'll say if you're a user, um, I'm assuming that you're an HPRC user or you're in some way kind of related to HPRC. If you're on our mailing list, um, if something does come up, then you'll get, um, actually everybody at AM will get it because it'll definitely go out to Tenwood Opt. Um, so quick answer is nothing's on the schedule right now, um, but I, I think with, with your request, we could we could definitely look into doing something like that in the future. Um, I'd be super down to uh, figure out, like put together a little lesson on, on Git or something. Um, that, that could be pretty, pretty easy and very, very useful, I think. Um, and uh, no problem. Um, and then the other question um, was, uh, you don't need the VPN for Globus, right? Uh, correct, you don't need the VPN for Globus um, because when you log into Globus, um, when you log into Globus, uh, you authenticate with CAS. So it, it already takes you through um, like authentication right there. Uh, if, you, if you're running a local endpoint on your, on your computer, so let's say I, I download uh, Globus Connect and I run an endpoint. I think I actually do have Globus Connect on this computer. But uh, if I was running an endpoint on my computer, I would need to connect my computer to the VPN for the connection to go through. Um, if I'm just using the Globus web interface, I don't believe I need the VPN to make trend, uh, to make, um, uh, transfers, but if I'm running a local uh, endpoint server, then I would need it. Um, I'm pretty sure, I'm like 90% sure. <laughs> Not a problem. Good question, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, well, with
no more questions. Um, again, thank you to everybody who came. I hope you guys have a great Friday. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. If you if you think of any other questions, uh, again, email them, help at hbrc.tamada.edu. Um, that's our help desk line. Uh, there's a bunch of people that watch that email. We can get you guys an answer. But other than that, uh, appreciate you guys. Have a great Friday and uh, stay safe out there.